When we think about our healthcare providers, visions of highly knowledgeable people who can solve all of our problems in a calm, reassuring way come to mind. We expect our doctors, nurses, dentists, pharmacists, and other caregivers to be our heroes, ones that know everything, do everything, and meet all of our needs. Few of us think about who they are beyond the walls of the offices in which we meet them. Perhaps it's not fair to label them as heroes, bounding in to save the day. What issues might they be dealing with, causing them stress or creating burdens on their mental well-being? In recent years, mental well-being has been increasingly discussed. COVID, in particular, shed light on the well-being of those who care for us, as they were the ones on the front lines in the hospitals and clinics, trying to meet the needs of very sick people because of a mysterious virus, while also making sure their own families were safe. How do our healthcare workers deal with the stress of their professions? What tools are available to make sure they are taking care of themselves? Did COVID mark a change in the acceptance of how we view mental well-being, as well as elevate the importance of expressing our humanity and how we treat each other, much less ourselves? Welcome to Teach Well, Learn Well, a podcast series highlighting the scholarship being published by members of the University of Tennessee Health Science Center's community about effective ways to teach. I'm Tom Lochner of UTHSC's Teach and Learning Center. Each month, we interview members of our faculty about their research and its impact on the higher education community. Today, we start a two-part series with Dr. Jessica Gold, Associate Professor of Psychiatry in the College of Medicine and the Chief Wellness Officer for the University of Tennessee System. She is the author of a new book titled, How Do You Feel? One Doctor's Search for Humanity in Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Gold. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations on the book. I'm really excited to see it published. I read it uh, twice now, and it is just really great work. That's awesome. Thanks for reading it so many times. I, uh, I love the opening line of the book. You start out with, everything was fine until it wasn't. It really draws you in. Tell me about your inspiration for that line. I think we spend a lot of time just saying we feel okay or fine and get by that way, especially in healthcare. We just kind of keep going and keep going and keep going until we can't anymore. And I think it in that line encompasses that, but also the conversations I've had with patients. So I primarily see healthcare workers. I work on this campus seeing people in university health services, so faculty, staff, and students. And I have had that experience for the past couple of years too in my previous institution. And I think we like to say things are fine, but they're really usually not. And so I think it just is a way to kind of say, this is something we're all experiencing and we can tell the truth about it. I think even for, for lay folks like me, there's always those epiphany moments where you think things are well and somebody says something either offhanded or just, you know, uh, as you're in a conversation, you think, wow, things aren't really the way I thought they were. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we're really good at still going through the motions at work. Um, you know, I think for workplaces, we don't really notice something's wrong with us until someone points it out or until we're not doing our work. But a lot of other things probably were going on before then. And so something might happen where you get more angry or something all of a sudden doesn't work or you get in a situation at work with a colleague or a patient and you don't like your reactions. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this hasn't been good for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tell me about your inspiration for this book and why you wrote it. So it wasn't like I had one moment where I was like, this is what I need to write about and I have to write it now. But I have been working with healthcare workers and I did work with healthcare workers over the pandemic and had my own experience with burnout in that context. So was seeing patients who are frontline workers and at the same time hearing what they were saying and at the same time trying to cope by myself as a single person in my house doing telehealth that I hadn't really been doing before. And I realized how much was different and how hard it was for me. And I think I had always been interested in healthcare worker mental health pre-COVID and had this awareness that this was going to be a particularly challenging time period for us and it would continue moving forward. And I've been writing for a while since med school and writing's always been a way for me to both process and sort of advocate in a different way. And I felt like I had a good platform for that. I had the experiences as a clinician. I had the experiences as an administrator. I had sort of a unique perspective from my own experience to shine light 
in this conversation that needed to have a continued light shined on it. I think people cared about our well-being a bit during the pandemic, but I'm not sure that that's still the case. And I don't think as many people cared about it before as I did. And so I really wanted to have a conversation about how we got here and what it's like to be caring for other people when you should be caring for yourself too and how hard it is to balance that and how somebody who is an expert in this stuff can still not be perfect at it because it's a work in progress. And so I, I, I hope that, you know, the inspiration kind of came from my experiences, but it feels applicable to other people who haven't really seen their stories in writing. Your therapist, you write about in your book you, that your therapist asked you to write and reflect. Was this book the start of that? I mean, did the, was was the suggestion by your therapist the start of the book or were you already writing? I was probably writing intermittently because I was writing for popular press sources prior to the book. And so I think, you know, I'd have a story and I'd write that story or I'd have an experience or thought and write about that. But nothing like this long or continuous or a narrative. And I think with my therapist, she was really big on me not writing for other people first, you know, really taking the time to write it down, reflect, have real emotions and feelings about it, not being worried about syntax, not being worried about the message or the meaning, but really just writing. And I think, you know, she didn't want me to use a computer for that reason, because once I was on a computer, I was like ready to go to write the next piece. And so I got a paper journal, I got real pens and really tried to remind myself how to write with my hands. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think it did start me thinking about this and like led me to keep processing it. I think it's sometimes you know, easy in the moment to either process while something's going on or avoid it while it's going on. And maybe you don't have to feel like you have to think about it afterwards. But I had been meeting with my therapist all along and processing it as I went. But the reflecting, like the reflecting back part, I think really did help me a lot with understanding this time period, but understanding all the issues at play. And so I think her suggestion definitely motivated more reflection than maybe I would have given it otherwise. Your book is, is very introspective uh, and gets more introspective as you proceed through the book. That initially it's, it's what you're experiencing but in the later chapters is very personal and, and the, the struggles you have. Is that intentional, the way that you laid that out? I think so. I think we start with like an, a behavior or a big feeling and we don't know where it comes from and it takes time to figure out where it comes from. And, you know, just like anybody, I'm not an expert in myself all the time. You know, I think we would love to be experts in everything, but sometimes we're not. And I think I will be tired and not know why or have a big emotion and not know why and get angry and not know why. And so having the ability to sort of like step back and reflect and really start to understand connections, that's really what therapy does. And I have gone regularly for a long time, but, you know, I think in the context of this book, it, you get deeper and deeper the more you think about things and think about the connections between things or think about why you're reacting to a patient a certain way or why you're thinking a certain thing. And so I think you can start pretty surface, but that's not enough. And so the deeper I was able to go with my own experience and my own reflection probably just kind of was born out of having more time with it and thinking more about it. Who's your audience for this book? So the most obvious audience is that it's written for healthcare workers, but I would say that it's not written for healthcare workers exclusively. So, you know, the, you know, if you're a healthcare worker and you've struggled and you've never seen yourself reflected in a book, I would hope that you would feel reflected in these stories. So all of the stories that are told are healthcare workers or what I would call healthcare worker adjacent, meaning there's a pre-med because they're not quite there yet. And I, I would hope in those stories, you would see yourself, your experiences, your struggles in training and know that you're not alone. I would feel the same way for therapists or people who work in mental health, because I'm talking about my story. But as much as I'm an MD, I'm also an MD who sometimes does therapy and goes to their own therapy. So that is included in that. And then I think there's a group of people who are just interested in the lives of healthcare workers. There's TV shows about it. People really like that. So it is a behind the curtain look at what we do in our jobs and how our jobs affect us. Um, I think if you love somebody who's in healthcare, if you care about your own doctor or nurse, you might 
be curious about it too, because, you know, we are human and our job does affect us and it does explain that in a lot of ways. And then I would say like the sort of tertiary audience is sort of any caregiver. So all of us in some way or another are caring for other people, often in spite of caring for ourselves. And that is a very prominent theme. Uh, Being a healthcare worker is just a specific way of doing that. Not everybody does that, but all of us struggle with burnout, overwork, Mm -hmm. perfectionism, you know, these sort of themes that come up. And, And I think the themes would be relevant to people, even if their job isn't to see patients. I'm glad that you said that because as I was reading it, I felt the same way that it was, a, it was a book that was for healthcare workers that was saying it's okay to feel this way. Here's some things that you can do. But again, as a lay person, uh, you know, when I go to the doctor, the doctor comes in, gives his advice and then leaves and you don't really see anything else that's going on. And, you know, he's a half hour late. And you, so you're sitting there saying, well, why is he a half hour late? And, you're, and you don't know that, you know, these these doctors and nurses and healthcare providers, they have lives outside of that little office that you see them in. And, and so it really helps, like you said, lift the curtain on what's going on in their lives. Yeah. I mean, there's so many systems at play in healthcare that I think I wouldn't want a patient to know, honestly, sometimes like when we're dealing with things like writing notes or the time limits on sessions or things like that, where it's so frustrating for us, but we don't want patients to have to know that that's why we're running out. But I think understanding that all those things are taken into account, but at the core, we all really did this because we care about people and want to help people, I think is really important to remember. So as frustrated as you are by the systems in play, when you're seeing a doctor, you're in a hospital or your loved one is, we're probably just as frustrated because all we want to do is take really good care of you. And we really do care about that. And I think sometimes that gets lost in the context of insurance companies or bills Mm. or, you know, a bad outcome or whatever it is where you're kind of dealing with a situation that comes up, but you don't actually get to talk about it like a human or with a human. Yes, and I also have a daughter who's a nurse. She's a nurse during COVID in Florida uh, at the time that the hurricane came through Tampa. And so as I was reading this book, I was also thinking of her struggles during that time and, and what we might have done to support her through all that. Yeah, you know, I had some friends and family after they read an early copy say that they wish they had done more for me. Mm. And I thought it was kind of interesting because I didn't write it as like a, you didn't do enough and I'm by myself and I had to figure this out on my own. But I guess when you put it like that, it just clarifies some things for people like your behaviors, like avoiding phone calls or something like that, or, you know, not wanting to go home or whatever kind of avoidant mechanism you're, you're doing that your parents or your loved ones don't understand. I think that it clarified that in some capacity or like helped understand something that I wasn't comfortable expressing yet, or I hadn't put into words yet. And so I definitely didn't write it to guilt trip them by (laughs) any means, but you know, I appreciate that, you know, in reading that they feel they could have done more or they wish they had done more or, you know, that I had expressed it, but I don't like asking for help. And that's also in there. And none of us do. It's just not what we're supposed Mm. to do. We're supposed to do it ourselves and help other people. And so I'm not going to say I need help until I really need help. Um, I believe asking for help is a strength, not a weakness, but I do think that for the most part I can handle things. And I think that that's a, common thing in a lot of us but for sure in healthcare workers like I I can do this I can do so many things I did training I did like weeks of going to night float and not sleeping I did med school you know whatever other challenge you want to put on us like all of those things were things we overcame and could do and so sometimes we put things in weird perspectives where we think that it doesn't quite measure up or a patient has something worse so how dare we complain because I'm sitting here listening to all this stuff and that's worse but I'm trying to get better at the understanding that like our biggest problems are our problems and we're allowed to have feelings about the problems in our lives. But that's why I wouldn't have asked for help from my family because I'm sitting there listening to frontline workers all day at home in my house. And I didn't think it mattered that I was a little bit sad and a lot bit burnt out. It's ironic that our parents raise us to be so independent. And so we become independent, but then we've lost a lesson somewhere of when to ask for help. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it shouldn't run counter. Independence should be that you are able to handle some things, but also know when you can't yep. or something. But for some reason, we miss that part in the framing. Your book is written in the context of what was going on in COVID and the struggles that healthcare workers were having with COVID. As I was reading the book, it was reminding me that, you know, we're almost four or five years out from the start of that, that and memory is faded. And you mentioned at the start of the book that, you know, some of the things that we read might trigger things. And what was triggering for me was the start of that COVID and how hectic and chaotic everything were, it was. And, and here we were trying to get faculty ready to do online learning. We were trying to get students ready to be working from home. We were also thinking about the students that weren't necessarily in good home situations and how we were going to help them with feelings of isolation or uh, students that didn't have really good uh, partners at home and, and their care. And so it was very chaotic at the same time. And then on top of that, and you bring in, you know, our health, our faculty, our healthcare workers, and they were on the front line of all of this. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a very chaotic time, especially at the start of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't necessarily write it to be this memory for people, but it was that for me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my editor and I talked as the further we got away from COVID, whether COVID was the right time period to be writing about because people do have such strong opinions about COVID from whether it was their personal experience or sort of how people reacted to COVID around them. But, you know, to me, COVID was this time that brought forward a lot of existing problems in healthcare that we would maybe not have seen to the extent that we saw it if it wasn't for COVID. So our emotional well-being, sort of the the breaks in the system, things like not having enough supplies, things like not knowing what to do in these kind of extreme circumstances. And so COVID is this big, big stressor as much as it maybe has a lot of other things for people, but it, it made things worse that were maybe already there or about to be there. And so it did shine a light, put a magnifying glass on, whatever metaphor you want to put for the things that probably some of us were already kind of worried about in healthcare, um, but maybe not everybody was, and hopefully more people are now. And the experience was so different for different people. So, you know, you had people who had families who were living in nursing homes and the isolation they had, or, or, or folks who had people that passed away during that, or, or you talk about that you were living by yourself at the time and the isolation that you felt. You had people who had multiple families in their home and COVID came in and everybody got it because they were so close together. Uh, business owners and the, and the impact that it had on the business. And, and I had to remind myself of that too, because in a way for me and my personal experience, even though it was chaotic and stressful and I was worried about how we we're going to take care of our family, it was nice because my son came home from college and I got to spend six months with him and uh, we slowed down. We weren't running off to games and everything. So our stressors were, you know, how to make sure we had toilet paper and, and sort of those basic essentials. But uh, it is a reminder that the experience was so different for so many different people. And at the same time, while we were at home and enjoying each other's company, you know, the TV was on. And so we saw what was going on in New York City and, and the governor would come on with his, you know, his press conferences every day. And CNN had a little thing, the, the number of deaths and it was just strolling up. So there's this dichotomy between, you know, we're in this really nice environment here, but also the realization that there were people that really had it pretty bad. Yeah, it was really different everywhere and depended on what your home structure was, what your job was. I think people forget that people like grocery store, pe people who worked in grocery stores were frontline workers in these situations. I think people forget that sometimes even in hospitals, we have people who clean the hospitals who are in the front line for this kind of complete unknown of really how to manage the germ situation. And I, having seen sort of the gamut of people during the pandemic, just really heard a lot of different stories, but probably a, just a lot of unknown. And I think that was the biggest thing. So much anxiety because of unknown. Like, you know, we want control and we didn't have control and we couldn't get control. And so for me in supporting people's mental health through it was hard because I couldn't fix COVID. And so I would feel like 
people would come in and still be sad or still be anxious. And I could listen and hear them, but I couldn't drug away COVID. Like I couldn't give you an antidepressant and you're magically going to be able to tolerate this thing that none of us have ever tolerated before. And so I found it very hard to do my job effectively. And I think that further contributed to my own sort of feelings of burnout and inefficacy um, because I would just watch and say, well, this person's story is sad and I can't fix that. Or that person's husband died. I can't fix that. And this person is trying to go to work, but has a chronic illness and probably shouldn't. And, you know, I would just try to picture all of those things and not feel like I had a great solution. And my therapist had to remind me that like, obviously people were coming back. So my job wasn't just drugging people <laughs> that, that like, you know, listening and being there for people sometimes has its own benefits. And I think that gets lost. I think even in mentorship, you know, speaking of the things that you care a lot about, that gets lost because we think like someone has a problem, I want to help them fix it. But sometimes you can't fix the problem and you just have to support them through it. And that's important in mentorship as much as it is in clinic, like being a clinician and, and walking them through something like this. And so I had to kind of reestablish that as a valid thing that I was doing because the medical model is so like, fix it. Mm -hmm. even though my meds are not that great. I'm in psychiatrist. So, but, you know, I think we still kind of have the model of, I want to figure out what will work so you can feel better. And it doesn't always work. And us patients always have the attitude and the feeling that the doctors can just come in and fix it. Yeah. And, and don't understand necessarily when the doctors can't figure out what's wrong or how to take care of it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've had, I had to tell patients in COVID some of what I just said to you, like, I feel a little helpless that I can't fix X. How can I help you? Like, what would be helpful? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that's a little more self-disclosing than I've been taught in school or that other people would want, but I felt like I should, I had patients genuinely want to know what was going on in my life during COVID. Um, I think because they were, afraid that I was at risk and they wouldn't mm. have a doctor and they mm. cared about me as a human. And the way they asked felt more real than sort of a casual, like, hi, Dr. Gold, how are you? It was like, hi, Dr. Gold, I know you see frontline workers. What's going on with you? And I felt compelled to give them real answers because they were asking me a real question for a real reason. And it wasn't a way of distracting from their own stuff. It wasn't a way of me distracting from their stuff. It was genuinely like, you're a human going through this. I'm a human going through this. I just want to make sure as a human, you're okay. And I decided I was okay telling them the truth about that stuff because they shouldn't have to worry about me too. They have enough to worry about. Your, your book talks about, and the subtitle is about the humanity in healthcare. And so it was one of the really nice things to see through COVID is that spirit of humanity coming across that people were looking to take care of each other and neighbors looking out for neighbors and patients looking out for doctors and, and everybody sort of making sure everybody was okay. Yeah. I think we lose that a lot in some of these systems in healthcare is that we become numbers or we become output people, people who just see a certain number of patients, people whose job is to clear a certain cost or, you know, something like that. And these things that are from the outside start to dictate how we care for people. And really at the core, we just want to care about people and we're humans caring for people. And I'm an empath by far. If you look at my Clifton strengths, it's like, you know, second after achiever, mm. because that shouldn't also surprise you. I mean, <laughs> I'm an achiever and then an empath. And so I think a lot of people who do this work are because we're taught, you know, this is a field of achievers, but it is a field of people who care too. And I think when you put that together, sometimes it can be a recipe for burnout um, because we do lose the the sort of empathy part in the context of sort of trying to survive in the amount of people we're taking care of in the situation we're taking care of them in, in the drive to still be a quote unquote hero or whatever you want to say. So, I, I mean, I think finding that again or being sure to check in with that is, is critical. That concludes part one of our conversation with Dr. Jessica Gold, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and the University of Tennessee's Chief Wellness Officer. 
We'll continue our discussion in the next episode when we'll talk about mental wellness and how our healthcare providers are learning self-compassion and self-care. Until next time, 